Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 790. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 21st, 2023. All right, you're watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted, kind of the after the crash episode. We'll be talking a lot about the Church of England, what's going on around the world in Christian news, and uh, glad you could join us. Before we get into the show, and before you forget, it'd be really cool right now if you click that like button, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, the show lives not here with the faces of Kevin and George. It lives in the comment section. So if you are on YouTube, just scroll down further, 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 you're going to see comments. That's where you say your opinion. And we read them all. We appreciate you guys uh, adding your thoughts, ideas, and uh, commentary to what's going on around the world. And what's going on around the world is just crazy. What a time to be alive. George, how you doing? I'm doing fantastically, Kevin. I'm doing great. The as you say, the world seems to be going crazy. The Anglican world is leading the charge sometimes. But, you know, life goes on today. Uh, this, this church is a hive of activity. We've got the pancake dinner tonight for Shrove Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So the, the men are all steam cleaning the carpets because we're going to get a fresh layer of maple syrup tonight. Uh, it looked like... Uh, I don't know, we were acting like the Russians were in Orlando because we have these barrels outside with burning things and we're burning palm fronds for Ash Wednesday tomorrow and mm -hmm. just all the activity and, you know, working with... I get men to come to church because they can burn things and play with power tools, and that is my secret. It works. Uh, yeah, I, my, my thought of volunteerism is Tom Sawyer, the way he would get people to paint the, uh, the that white fence by giving him things to you know paying him to be allowed to, to paint the fence and that's how it works that's how it should be done all right let's move on to some news there is a lot of news um well, let's start at the top why not the global south has issued a press release with their thoughts on what happened in the church of england last week and their thoughts are listen that the c of e has disqualified itself and certainly the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has as well. And we can no longer recognize him as the first among equals. And boom, here it is, George. The Anglican Communion has in one felt swoop because the Church of England and Justin Welby become the Anglican Ecumenical Communion. Yeah, the, uh, it's no longer threats. Action has been taken. On Monday of this week, February 20th, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans released a seven-point statement. And the statement's key points were, first, the Global South can no longer, and I will quote, recognize the present Archbishop of Canterbury, the Right Reverend and Most Right Honorable and Most Reverend Justin Welby, as the first among equals of the Global Communion. Now, why are they saying that? Because he has sadly led his House of Bishops to make recommendations that undergirded the General Synod motion on living in love and faith, knowing that they run contrary to the faith and order of the Anglo Orthodox provinces of the Communion. So Justin Welby deliberately took the Church of England by his leadership of the House of Bishops into false teaching, heterodoxy, may I even say heresy. Heresy, yeah. The second point that they make, major point, is that the Church of England has departed from the historic faith passed down from the apostles by its innovation in the liturgy of the Church and her pastoral practice. These innovations contravene their own canons, and therefore she has disqualified herself from leading the communion as the historic Mother Church. Twelve of the 24 Global South archbishops or primates signed this statement. Uh, all of them were from the global south, meaning below the equator, if you will, mm -hmm. except for Foley Beach. They were all from uh, South America, Africa, Asia, the Pacific. And the other 12, nobody's against it. Some of them, like Central Africa and Southeast Asia, released their own statements condemning the decision by General Senate but saying, we're not quite ready 
to break complete unity and fellowship with the Church of England. These 12 have, and this is a tremendous slap down to the Archbishop of Canterbury. This is a destruction of the Anglican communion as we've known it. No more threats, no more, if this happens, then we'll do that. It's happened. Mm -hmm. Justin Welby has been dethroned as leader of the Anglican communion. We do not celebrate this. We do not go, told you so. We do not say, um, of course, Justin Welby did this. We do this with sorrow. This is horrible mm -hmm. news. Uh, the Anglican Communion, uh, with all its faults, was a pretty good place to uh, to grow a church, as seen in the Global South, as seen in Africa, as seen here in North America under the ACNA. Um, I, I, I'm just dumbfounded that we would go this way without um, seeing the short history that led up to the Episcopal Church uh, causing a tear in the fabric to watch what's happening in Canada. Uh, Justin Welby and the Church of uh, England have you know, decided that they know better. Mm -hmm. And in they know better, they have thrown out tradition They've thrown out scripture, and foremost, in my mind, they've thrown out reason. Mm -hmm. And they've done this to gain the world, but lose their salvation. Um, and the, the, the discussions behind this statement have long been coming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a year or so ago, Munir Anis was arguing that of Egypt that we need to have a new leader that is elected by the primates, not who is uh, appointed by the prime minister of Great Britain. We need a new way of doing things to respond to the new world in which we live, a post-colonial world where England sneezes and the rest of us catch cold from, the, from their actions. Mm -hmm. And the primates have been particularly harsh on the person of Justin Welby. They heard him, they read his speech at Synod saying, if we adopt gay blessings, this will lead to the murder of people in the Anglican world, raping of women, murdering of children and men. This will lead to the destruction of Christian communities by jihadists who will take this opportunity to destroy Christian churches. This is the excuse they need. So if you are a Christ if you're an Anglican Christian in Khartoum, if you're an Anglican Christian in Peshawar, in Pakistan, or in northern Nigeria, this is the warrant gift that we, and Justin Welby is saying this, and he was tearful when he was saying this. Mm -hmm. But then he went on to say, but nonetheless, we need to do this, and now I'm being commentary, we need to do this to assuage the never-ending yapping of the gay lobby in the Church of England. We have to basically buy our peace by sacrificing, literally sacrificing to death, Christians in the developing world. We know oh, this is bad theology. We know this is bad scripture. We know this is contrary to the rules, but we're still going to do it because we need to be pastoral to that gay minority within our midst. Well, what the, the gay minority has done successfully has been white noise for the last 20 years. And what they've mm -hmm. done every year is kind of just ratchet up uh, a couple of decibels uh, over the decades to now, George, they don't have 10 on the dial. They went to 11, mm -hmm. you know, and in doing so, I hope people get that reference in, in doing so um, they have won a victory over the church of England and they have certainly been able to f cause hopefully not a final split, but a split within the communion. And mm -hmm. at every part, whether it's the Episcopal Church and Gene Robinson, or now it's uh, Justin Welby and the Church of England, at every part, um, the people who know better weren't able to stop it. Uh, there are very conservative bishops in the Church of England, they, but we don't hear from them. Well, I don't understand why. The only one who has publicly spoken out is Jill Duff, the Bishop of Lancaster, a suffragan bishop. Mm -hmm. No diocesan bishops have spoken out forcefully. Um, 
At the, la at the last Lambeth conference, Keith Sinclair, who was the head of the Church of England Evangelical Council, and he was helping the Global South Archbishops uh, uh, put their uh, plans together. He was taken aside by, uh, I think, D Ken Porter, David Porter, Ken and Porter, at that time, Welby's chief of staff, and basically publicly humiliated for siding with the foreigners against his lawful archbishop. And ever since that point, Sinclair has basically been a spent force. He's a, you know, he really doesn't want the job, but nobody else will step up to it. So what's happening within the Church of England's College of Bishops is that they are really whipping the clergy in a, in, in, the bishops in a parliamentary sense to toe the line, toe the line. If you step out of line, we're going to make life difficult for you and all this and that. And the bishops have chosen to follow their archbishop. Now, some of them, Christopher Coxworth, the Bishop of Coventry, who's considered an evangelical, he wrote a long article that appeared on the Covenant website, just saying he doesn't agree with the path, but here's the thinking and here's the logic. And as I've read through his paper, I realize that he is not hearing the world. Yeah. What he has, he's so wrapped up in the minutiae of process that he doesn't understand that the justifications being offered, the arguments being offered, are of no account, of no persuasive value, save within the halls of the College of Bishops of the Church of England. They, they don't satisfy the left. They don't satisfy the orthodox. They just sort of give emotional sanction for the evil that people do um I, I i know it's extreme to use these analogies but i'm just reminded by you know the sort of phenomena after the war was over in germany we knew nothing about the holocaust you know we've we been living know in what that we didn't know what that smell was we yeah. uh, we didn't know where our neighbors <laughs> are down the hall in our apartment building were deported to we don't know how where they disappeared to we don't know we know nothing and the amnesia, they know full well what's going on, but they would rather not know. And this delusional thinking that they can come up with some sort of uh, clever plan to hold things together is delusional. Well, here's, here's the ultimate delusion, because this has kind of turned into a Star Wars narrative. In the papers in Britain, uh, this was leaked. And the leak headline was Rebel Anglican African Bishop. And I'm like, what, the Rebel Alliance? What, what do you, what, what's going on here? Well, if, if the African bishops are the Rebel Alliance, I know who Darth Vader is in this. And I don't think we want to make that uh, uh, a comparison, but you leaked it, you, you have to hold it. So it's, it's crazy, George. Well... Let's let's you let's let's put our full <laughs> science fiction geekdom on display. Sure, why not? The College of Bishops of the Church of England, like the Borg, you will be assimilated. Absolutely. Or or we have a bunch of Daleks running around uh, saying exterminate, exterminate anybody <laughs> who steps off of the party line. The this was distributed to the twenty four primatial offices before it was released. And I'm putting together the pieces. I can't, I can't say this with certainty, but my thinking is that this was sent to Welby as well. And the word is that Welby blew up. He was just livid because this, all the work he has done to sort of balance between two stools, the chairs have been kicked out from under, the legs have been kicked out from underneath these stools and he's collapsed. Mm -hmm. Somebody then leaked it to the London newspapers. Well, I'm pretty confident that it was the Archbishop's office. We don't know. We don't but, know. Yeah. But they only leaked portions of it. And the spin, as you rightly point out, Kevin, is that the rebels, when if you had the whole statement and if you had and if you looked at this dispassionately, the rebels are the bishops and the Church of England not the Anglican Communion, because they're the ones that are seeking to overthrow the existing order. And having done so, they've now been caught out, but the way it was spun 
as it was handed to the press in England was these pesky Africans and rich Americans are buying all these votes and this and that and the other. It's the same story we've heard for years, but that's how it came out. Okay. What happened on Monday after the report came out? Yeah. Justin Welby, who had this for a few days before, he doesn't respond directly. He has his office put out a statement that essentially says nothing other than you can't make me. That I'll go if all the instruments of communion want me to go. And then Anthony Pogo, the Secretary General of the Anglican Consultative Council, put out a longer letter that made errors of fact and those errors of fact were, he said that, oh, the Global South is being misled into thinking that this blesses sexual relationships outside of marriage. It only blesses the people. It doesn't bless the relationships. Yes. Well, Sam Margrave, a conservative member of General Synod, was very quick to go onto Twitter and point out this is untrue. Archbishop Justin Welby and Sarah Mullally in their press conference explaining this said this blesses non-marital sexual relationships. And, and then she went, she went on to say that gay relationships and civil unions in the, the church setting no longer need to be celibate. Yes, they're not sinful anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the left... Uh, got on to the Twitter and said, no, 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 this is not what was said. So both left and right are saying Anthony Pogo's statement is untrue. And then Pogo went on to say, well, the instruments of communion have to decide this. It's not up to the primates. Well, three of the four instruments of communion are controlled by the Archbishop of Canterbury. One is the Archbishop of Canterbury's office. The second is the Lambeth Conference, and he calls it every whenever he wants. Last year was a 12, 13-year gap. We had it. And the third is the Anglican Consultative Council. The Anglican Consultative Council just met in Accra, Ghana, and they elected Maggie Swinson, a laywoman from Liverpool, England, to be its chair. She ran unopposed. Why was she unopposed? Because it was Buggins' turn, as they say. Yeah, it's like it was, the Republican it, it, Party. The next person in turn gets <laughs> to run for president. Mm -hmm. Swinson is a drone, a functionary, a tool of Justin Welby, a person of no independence of mind, thought, or or in power. And she she wasn't even re-elected to General Synod. If she were a person of consequence politically, she would certainly have been elected to General Synod. She wasn't elected to that. Instead, it was the old boys network. And so now we've got a an, a tool, an agent of Justin Welby running the ACC. Well, hold on. Wait, now, wait. I, I was under the impression the ACC would never discuss doctrine. That's right. Um, at the last ACC meeting... Uh, Ed Kanishki, Ed Kanishushki, Ed, Ed, Bishop Ed from Oklahoma, one of the American delegates, put forward a resolution on gay issues, and it really was divisive, and the Anglo Africans really fought tooth and nail. And, it, and after that resolution, the ACC voted not to discuss doctrinal issues. So here's the thing they can't, they, some people were thinking, well, maybe we'll finally get clarity from the ACC on what the Church of England is doing. And the ACC said, no. Now, even though the bishops of the Church of England say this doesn't change doctrine, we at the ACC think it does. Therefore, we're not going to touch this with a 10-foot pole. So Welby, even though he's publicly climbing down and saying, I will not stand in the way, he's throwing up bureaucratic roadblocks to prevent the church from reforming in a way that he doesn't like. Will this be successful? I don't think so. I think it's like, what? who cared about the League of Nations after Germany invaded Poland in 1939? You know, it was a farce. It was nothing. Well, I think we've hit the point now where the Archbishop of Canterbury can no longer be trusted in the minds of the Global South and uh, all the other primates as well. Because, including Rowan Williams, when they were tasked to do something to help correct the church, Rowan Williams was supposed to fight in Louisiana. 
House of Bishops here in the Episcopal Church and correct Catherine Jefferts Shorey and uh, seek some type of resolution. Uh, Justin Welby was told by the Primates Gathering that we want to hold the Episcopal Church accountable for three years. Can you take care of that? For I'm your guy. And so nobody trusts the I'm your guy anymore uh, because they won't follow through with holding people accountable, especially now that they need to be held accountable. That's that. This is what breaks everything up. So, what does the Global South do next? Can they can they gather up enough primates to hold a meeting outside of the control and authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury, George? We don't know what's going to happen, but there's several. But Kevin, as you suggested, there's several avenues of approach. Mm -hmm. Justin Welby wants to hold an emergency primates meeting. If Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, and so forth don't show up, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If, meanwhile, in April, we have GAFCON meeting in Kigali, Rwanda, will they take things up? Will they move things forward? I think we're in this stage where we may have almost the Anglican version of an Avignon papacy, where we have two popes for several hundred years in the medieval <laughs> church. Yes. And the, the money or the inherited wealth lay, lies in the northern churches. However, they're quickly spending down their assets. The money is just flowing out the door. Uh, and their numbers of people in the pews are declining rapidly. And their seminaries are shutting down they just are in the death throes of a an organization that is ready for bankruptcy and reorganization can't go on the way it has at the same time the global south is growing by leaps and bounds it's experiencing revival in many places but it's poor as a church mouse now what does that mean it means in the short term money can buy some things but in the long run uh the power of the spirit will basically dictate which which way things go. Um, well, there's a lot of truth to that statement because it, as much as this is a division within uh, the Anglican Communion right now, the Global South is basically uh, accusing the Church of England and Justin Welby of a heresy. You mm -hmm. are now false teachers. You are what is warned about in the New Testament. You are wolves in sheep's clothing. So it's not just that we want to get together sometime in the future and work this out. It's the global south and primates expect the repentance and return to the fold of Justin Welby and the Church of England. Nothing short can be accepted. You have left the, the, the brotherhood of the kingdom. Uh, the New Testament says we need to hold you accountable in this. However, because we worship a, a loving God, your repentance brings you back into the fold. So, I don't know. And, and at the end of the day, money really doesn't matter that much um, because God seems to provide the money when it's needed. Absolutely. I, I say that out of my own parish experience. <laughs> um, we're a poor parish in that we have no inherited wealth, and we basically start off with a how are we going to make it through the year? But each year we grow and each year we have the money to do it because the spirit moves people to join us, to worship with us, to be part of our life together. And God gives us enough of what we need. We don't have enough money to buy, you know, gold plated faucets for the ladies room, stuff like that. But God has provided. Now, let me just take a different, slightly different track. This has such major significance. When the Canadian churches like the St. John Shaughnessy in British Columbia and Vancouver and the other parishes were fighting to leave the Anglican Church of Canada, one of the things that was introduced in the lawsuits was that statements from the Church of England that, that Canada is still part of our network even though they've done all these things. If those lawsuits were held today, would there be a different judicial outcome? Mm -hmm because others could testify that the Anglican Church of Canada, it is the one that has rebelled, not the parish that seeks to move out of its diocese. 
This shakes up the equations pretty dramatically in a number of places. Um, in the, in the Episcopal Church, will this influence the Diocese of Central Florida or the Diocese of Florida or Albany or Dallas? Not in the short term, because we are all so scarred and scared of antagonism. So what, what difference does it make? Well, it shows us that it is possible to push back and then we work together, we will not be picked off individually. So see, I think you'll see further moves in the Episcopal Church a few years down the road. Let's say we have a new prayer book that memorializes gay marriage. That's a line that several bishops have said they cannot cross. It's one thing to have a liturgy on the internet somewhere that uh, you can download. It's another thing to have it in the book that's in the pew in front of you. When that line is crossed, will dioceses depart? Will parishes depart? I would think so. But if there's a new alternative structure that is not the ACNA, then there'll be success. See, one of the problems is in the Episcopal world for conservatives is that if you didn't jump to the ACNA right now, or when it started, there, there are a number of people in the ACNA that are as nastier to conservatives in the Episcopal Church than they are to the liberals. Oh, absolutely, yeah. and I've witnessed this. You know, oh, you didn't leave, you're not one of us. Um, and, uh, you know, it, because you're still in the Episcopal Church, you're being influenced by Satan. I've seen, I've seen those conversations uh, at levels where I felt uncomfortable. It wasn't just a lay person in the pews. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that sort of stuff isn't helpful. It's not particularly accurate, but people have their emotional baggage they deal with. Mm -hmm. So where do we see things going? It's hard to say, but so the, but the global primates have taken the box with all the puzzle pieces in it, shaken it up, and the game is now different. Yeah, much different. When will things be different? Don't know. But now more than ever, I think the GAFCON meeting really is going to be a telling indicator of which way things go. I would be willing to pay for the plane ticket of Manira Nice to go to GAFCON 4. I'm just, if, if he's not been invited, he probably should be there. George, let's move on to some more news. You and I, and there's a lot of discussions you and I have off camera, where we're not recording and you know just as part of a pre-show or conversations. And uh, I'd say over the last three or four years, you and I have had discussions, would the Episcopal Church ever allow another conservative bishop to be elected and consecrated? And I pretty much flatly state, no, won't happen. And you, you, you are an optimist. You say, no, it could probably happen, especially in these dioceses. They want to maintain the, the token uh, uh, bishop or so. And I'm like, maybe George is right, and I pray you're right, but I, I have right in front of me another story, which kind of you know proves me right. And I'm not, this is not a not on a boo boo story, but there is a report given on the Charlie Holt election, and he's being deep sixed again, and I it's, it's uncomfortable to watch because they aren't deep sixing him for the election; they're going to deep six him for the the current bishop of the diocese and maybe for Ron DeSantis. I don't know, you know, for some reason, Charlie Holt cannot be elected uh, to the Diocese of Florida because of other people, George. Well, it's the same thing we saw in Albany. Bill Love was done in by a very small minority of liberal clergy in his diocese who had the ear and connection of liberals in the national church. Mm -hmm and complaints were filed by a few clergy who despised uh, Bill Love, which is a pretty hard thing to do. It takes some He's, he's my favorite bishop. I don't get how, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay, well, second, and the same things happen in Florida. There's a small minority, a little over 10%, who cannot live with the thought that Charlie Holt will be their bishop. So they come up with all sorts of spurious accusations and say the process was unfair, the election was uh, didn't conform to the canons, this procedural point wasn't met, and it was sent back once to be redone. And after the second time, it had to be, they've won it redone again. And this went to a, a, uh, a 
commission review for the, Na or the National Episcopal Church, and the review issued and the review issued its report. And sadly, Kevin, the report had lives up to what your fear. Um, the report found that the election itself, the issue before them, was done properly. Then they went on, without being asked to do so, to comment on the diocese itself, and they said that we still think the election was suspect because the bishop there, Sam Howard, has not welcomed gay clergy or licensed retirees who are gay in, the, in that diocese so that they can vote in the election. And if this had happened, if you had yeah. more gay people, then Charlie Holt may not have been elected. No, the, he wouldn't have, and we, we, we would not have to have this silly meeting and issue a report. Yeah. So, essentially, they're not being told immediately because the election was fair, but the uh, but they're basically now giving ammunition for the liberals in the diocese to write to all the bishops and standing committees and say, see, it's suspect, and we may have to have a third round. And the newly elected bishop in Central Florida, Justin Holcomb, is just as conservative as Charlie Holt is. However, there isn't that minority. And oddly enough, if Sam Howard had been more effective in being like John Howe and making sure there were no gay clergy, there were no liberals, or if we have it, we've got the one token parish. Token, yep. We wouldn't have this problem. But by allowing, but by following the go along and get along principle, you created a small enough minority that could cause trouble. So we're not, so will Central Florida have this trouble? Probably not because the, well, first off, the Central Florida Search Committee made sure that uh, there would be nobody who would immediately be, be vetoed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we have three candidates one who was more conservative, one who would keep the same standards, and one who would loosen them. And the one who would keep the no change candidate was the one who won. Um, and he's a good fellow. I don't, you know, he'll be a good bishop. Well, the, but, the, he, this... he, but he was, he's not called to lead the charge for orthodoxy. He's, he's called to maintain the steady helm of the Diocese of Central Florida, and the rest of the world may do what it chooses. And, but Kevin, I, you're right. I mean, I think you made the comment, George, you're silly that you expect the liberals to be fair. Uh, uh, yeah, I said, well, I, what I said is, you said, well, when we're talking about the support pre show, you said, well, they'll be fair. And I'm like, when is evil fair? And you're like, yeah, okay, I get your point. I mean, basically, this, this uh, committee got together and, and pulled the Pontius Pilate. You know, they just washed their hands and, and passed it on to the bishops while tainting it. By the way, gays weren't allowed to vote on this because uh, Sam Howard doesn't allow that in his clergy. And so you need to know that before you really okay this. Ouch. So, well, we shall see what happens with Charlie Holt. I'm sure that will be part of our future discussions. And I sure hope it's not Ron DeSantos' fault. Um, oh, update well, on the... I, I, oh, actually, yeah. as an aside, uh, Orlando and, you know, Orlando was rejected as a site for the next general convention, plus one, because of Governor of DeSantis. <laughs> uh, well, there used to be the, the Trump uh, was the... Uh, where people overreact to it. Uh, Trump derangement syndrome. Now there's the DeSantis derangement syndrome. Uh, and Trump has it. It's just it's it's amazing to watch what's going on out there, in politics. And yeah, I I used to really enjoy politics. Now I just I, I can't even watch news anymore. The only two and Brits willing to okay yeah. I was just going to say yeah. I saw in the newspaper there was an article this morning. The crime rate in Florida as is at its lowest level right. in fifty years, yeah. right. and unemployment is at two point three percent. Um, people, you know, we're begging for jobs and all these people moving from California and New York state, they're immediately finding work. Now, so long as they don't bring their politics with them, uh, things will be fine. But, uh, the defund the police movement isn't here. Uh, 
It's far from it. Well, no, hold, but I've been here a while now. There is still a liberal press here. The, the, the Miami TV stations are very liberal, and every week they find one person who is leaving the state because they feel politically uncomfortable. And they had an interview last week. They posted on YouTube a, a three-minute video of this single mother who just doesn't feel she can send her kids to public schools because they wouldn't be learning everything about the world. They would just be learning about the conservative uh, viewpoint. And I'm like, well, they found that one person who's leaving Florida. That, that, that alone is journalistic pride right there. So, oh, George, it's so crazy out there. We should keep moving on to the well, other news. It, yeah. I, I just, just as an aside, there was an article yesterday. The Census Bureau has reported that 700,000 people have left the state of California. Uh, in the last two or three years. It's the first time in, I don't know, ever, ever. that the church yeah. has lost, that the diocese, California has lost population. And it's the same principle with the Episcopal Church. Uh, we're seeing, you know, when the crazies get in charge and when the crazies have a monopoly of power and are institutionalized, people, if they can, vote with their feet. They leave and move to another state that's more... I have a new parishioner who had a farm in the Central Valley of California, and he finally sold up. Uh, his sons didn't want to stay in farming because of the hassle of dealing with the government and labor problems, and he sold up his land uh, to a man, uh, to a rich tech guy who basically wanted to have a play farm, and he's moved here to Florida because he could make a living for third or fourth generation farmer he couldn't make it anymore and he's moved to uh, have crossed the country to florida where he, where he can start over with a farm yeah i mean and there's opportunities here to do so um i'm gonna give you numbers but jill and i bought a property here uh a year and a half ago yeah two years ago uh for a little bit of money before the crazy things uh went on with covid and the real estate boom and our property is worth 140% more than we paid for it in two years. That's nice. Like, that's really, really nice. And you're watching all the other parts of the country who had that same real estate boom have now ebbed and are going down. New York is crashing. San Francisco is crashing. All these places where we thought the value would keep going up. Here in Florida, it hasn't ebbed. I mean, we're in a in a straighter line. We're not going up 25% a month, but uh, the value still holds in this uh, state for now. Uh, things will change. Uh, another hurricane will, uh, you know, increase the value of my property, and more progressives being elected in Illinois, California, Washington uh, will also affect the economy here because it's supply and demand. We don't have enough property here for everybody. So either change the politicians back in your state uh, or expect to pay much more here. But I own my property. I'm just <laughs> I'm not worried about buying in anymore. George, we're going to run out of time here. Let's move on to some more stories. As I tried to hint before, there are only two Brits who were willing to pray outside of an abortion clinic in silence. They were charged with the crime of a thought crime praying outside and uh, they went to trial and were acquitted is that what we call it george yes father sean goff and elizabeth von spruce were brought to trial on the for having violated praying silently in a no prayer zone uh, each of their offenses they were different times but they were basically brought together and we had what in the United States we called jury nullification. That's what they did in the OJ trial. Guilty is sin, according to the letter of the law, but we're yeah. not going to send this person to prison for violating, a, you, know, you know, we're not going to do it. And so the people had spoke out in Birmingham, England, and at the court said, no, no, this is, this is government overreach, that policing people's thoughts, arresting a man, arresting a man, First off, attracting police attention because he's wearing a cassock in public. And then he is, you know, what are you doing? I'm praying. And, oh, you know, you're not allowed to pray here. What What exactly are you praying for? You know, being interrogated by the police and, you know, 
it just craziness. And well, the, the laws were followed. The man was arrested. The priest was arrested. The woman was arrested. And uh, the people have spoken. No, they're not going to they're not going to let the government go this far. Here in America, it's a little different. And uh, I just wanted to, to discuss that. Uh, Illinois has crazy gun laws uh, that go way beyond what our Constitution uh, prohibits. And the sheriffs of almost every county in Illinois say we're not going to enforce that. Yes, and, it's a law in the book, but we're not enforcing it. And Cook County, which is Chicago, yeah. says we can't enforce any laws, let alone <laughs> yes. gun laws. Yeah. <laughs> we're so, our, you know, we're we have so many police resigning because mm -hmm. of the hostility from the prosecutor's office, the woke mm -hmm. prosecutors, and the woke mayor. We have a shortage of police, and when we arrest people, they're let out, and it's just a thankless job. You're saying, saying things in Illinois. Uh, well, in or in Oregon, Oregon has very liberal pockets, Eugene, Portland, mm. down to Salem, sort of the northwest corner down a bit to the coast. The rest of the state is farmland and country and forests and is very conservative. Um, the Idaho legislature has invited two thirds of the land of the counties by land mass in Oregon to join Idaho and the counties want to join because they do not they their government is so crazy and kooky and you know legalization of uh, narcotics and all this you know, all the stuff that the latest crazes wokeness provides and you're saying the same movement in Illinois people downstate are saying we don't you know why Chicago runs our state because there's so many people in Chicago but they suck all the money out of the rest of the state and they give us these crazy laws of no bail I mean you know people get out on their own recognizance after sticking up a liquor store at, you can't defend yourself uh, mm -hmm. with a gun you're you're the villain if you do and so there are movements in some states Illinois and Oregon are the first the two come to mind other states as well of trying to break up the state. California, uh, there's uh, a movement of, uh, I think, to split the state into three. And yeah, been... that, that's kind of dead, but five years ago, they were really into, we can do it because we don't want the South, the South says we don't want the North, but everybody, everybody wants the wine country. So th there was something to be a fight over that. Uh, you know, so, that, so... That, that, that's just politics, George. You know. Uh, do you get? Do you have to live in a crazy location? But the thing, but the thing is, that that's failed politics because a good politician is able to balance competing interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, Florida is the same way. We have our liberal pockets, we have our conservative pockets, but we overall, as a state, we're fairly uniform because the the political class try to balance uh, the complete desires of the whole state rather than just cater to one special interest group. Yeah for now i mean if, now. if if de santos becomes president who would replace him hopefully not a moderate you know you get another de santos i hope but george we're really just talking local politics let's not bore the people out there we have an incredibly interesting story general seminary has been sold for 70 million dollars or is that just a rumor george that's a rumor. All right. <laughs> the <laughs> Ian, Mar Ian Markham, the dean of uh, dean of Virginia Seminary, which is a choir right. general uh, for uh, two draft picks and an outfielder, um, has hey. said said that Aaron he Rogers was called. Is uh, yeah, <laughs> he, he he was called by saying that some bishop is telling people that uh, general's been sold for seventy million dollars, and Ian Markham, the bit dean, said that's untrue. First off, that'd be a fire sale. That place is worth hundreds of millions of dollars because it's mm -hmm. location. And second, no, we've not sold it. We don't intend to sell it for the time being. We intend to develop it as we have laid out as a conference center, distance education center, and New York hub for our operations, not uh, a quick flip, uh, uh, in and out flipping the property to make money in the short term. So no, nope, General Seminary has not been sold. All right, next story. Indian corruption? Nope. Episode 788. 
89 of Anglican Unscripted was named uh, Asbury Revival. And for some reason, YouTube and Google and Facebook said, that's a hot topic. Let's promote this video everywhere. And so we've had our first viral Anglican Unscripted, George. 8,500 people watched the uh, YouTube stream. Uh, several more thousand watched the pod or listened to the podcast. Wow. Uh, we you know, certainly didn't intend to uh, be viral, but if there was going to be a viral one, it was going to be that because we were talking mostly about the uh, Church of England, not so much Asbury. But Asbury is still in the news, and uh, it's something we need to talk about because it's still happening. There's still uh, factions who say this is not of God. There's factions who say this is of God. There's people like me who say, well, God is out of the tabernacle ta temple portion of uh of getting to meet god he's more into the uh omnipresent get to meet god and how does this all work i don't know if we want to get into all that but i certainly think you and i need to talk about it's still going on that's true and in fact the administration at asbury college has said that we're closing it now to outsiders because we have been so overwhelmed by visitors. Uh, and the town has also asked that, you know, we there's no more space in this little town. There's no place to park your car. There's mm -hmm. no, I mean, there's not enough food in the grocery stores. I mean, it's just, they're being overwhelmed by people wanting to participate and experience this spiritual revival. So and, you're saying a revival had a toilet paper run? <laughs> the grocery store. Well, all right, you know. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm I'm saying that the logistics to su support a revival in a small town, mm -hmm. nobody planned this, and therefore they've, you know, there are no hotel rooms. There's no place to park. There's no place to park your car. Is that street. enough fish and bread to feed the people who've uh, gathered? Okay, all right. <laughs> so. And then they have cut back on the continuous live streaming. They're going to be broadcasting portions of it. But at the same time, as Asbury is trying to sort of restrict making this uh, an extravaganza, we're seeing this sign that it's sparking up in some other Christian colleges. Uh, Lee College, um, another college in... Uh, Sorry, I forgot its name. One, a Pentecostal college in Ohio, a Baptist college in West Virginia, at Samford University down in Alabama, are all experiencing these phenomena of signs of revival, of spontaneous worship breaking out. So it may, be, so it's spreading. Now, what I think is fascinating is that two of these colleges, Asbury and Samford, are ordination schools for the Anglican Church in North America. Yeah, they have, We uh, see the they, Asbury Renewal revival hit the ACNA. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, now, there's the factions who say this is clearly not of God. It's a bunch of people having an emotional reaction. Then there's the people who are, you know, all in saying this is a, a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit and uh, it, it's going to be the third and last great awakening uh, for Christianity in America. And it, from me as a observationist, as a journalist, it's interesting to watch. I can see both sides in this and uh, because I have a God bias and it's a pretty strong God bias, I understand that we have been praying for a revival here uh, inside and outside of the Methodist Church for decades. And I always pray with the expectation so if I pray for a revival and I see a revival, I'm not quick to say that's not a revival. <laughs> you know, nope, like I said, however, as I said in the last episode, we have to test these things. But this isn't something you can test right away. Mm -hmm. This is something that's going to take time to test. And my test for revival is finding the youth and the adults in a time of repentance understanding that they have been walking away uh, from a relationship with the Father and they have rededicated their life to the Father. That is revival. Now, an awakening is when we allow the people outside the church to see what's happening and to be drawn in, and they go through the repentance and baptisms and 
stuff like that. Because I'm not seeing mass baptisms right now, George. I'm seeing no. uh, students and people attending this church getting on their knees and repenting and sobbing and, and having a, yes, an emotional reaction, uh, but also, yes, having an experience. And many of them speak to that experience kind of beyond the emotion. A lot of them say, you know, I'd say half of them say this in a very emotional response. Nothing wrong with that. Well, so historians tell us that there's uh, six or seven marks of genuine revival. The first is adoration, that it begins with adoration in God. It's not clergy led. It's not. There's a difference between evang evangelistic outreach, which is planned mm -hmm. and structured and programmed, and revival, which is spontaneous. So with some of those marks are present that and those participating are seeking to seeking righteousness and holiness in their lives and that they are as you say repenting seeing to come closer to god to live l lives that are uh, appropriate to the gifts of love and faith and spiritual power that they've been given and some of these signs that are coming out of this show that for some people this righteousness is not a taking place and i see it in the comment section of our uh, of our show yeah. we had we had one person very nasty uh about anybody who doesn't believe is hell bound and satan bound and you there you're a sinner and you just don't appreciate the power of god all this and that now anger and pride and jealousy are not marks of the holy spirit so a person who's saying all this stuff is self-evidently not on a path of righteousness and holiness. They're in a path of self-righteousness. A lot of fruits so, there. Correct, yes. So that the, you know, the Apostle Paul tells us that, that Satan can appear to us as an angel of light. And Satan will be in this revival seeking to lead some people astray into factionalism, into my way or the highway thinking that we must all think and act and look the same in response to this event and true revival isn't that way at all true revival revives the catholic church it revives the pentecostal churches it revives the episcopal church not turning us into one blob but turning each of us back towards god and seeking his power and holiness in our lives and that looks differently in different traditions now our fear last week would this this would be co-opted by evangelical leaders or catholic leaders or charismatic leaders i don't see that i don't see anybody who's gone in there and said okay uh, who is the the uh, guy after president reagan was assassinated said i got everything under control you know no nobody alexander hayes. alexander hayes. hayes it goes in there nobody's saying hey i got this under control you know i i'm the, i'm the lead guy here there seems to still be uh, a just a conduction of services at the seminary uh, or at the chapel. There's just a, a continual people trying to pour into it. And so I don't see anybody co-opting that. That was my fear. Not seeing that, I'm more likely to say th this is a revival happening. Although you have to understand it is way too soon to determine that in any measurement we have. It, it Go ahead. There have been some news reports that certain ministries have approached the Asbury administration asking to partner and participate. And so far, I haven't seen little Pfizer ads in the bottom of the live stream. Anglican uh, TV. Uh, no. <laughs> in other words, the As Asbury, the, the, the elders at Asbury, the smart people, the wise people, mm -hmm. are managing this well by keeping away the public charlatans, by people who seek to buy uh, access to a market uh, through con contributing money to help underwrite this stuff. The Asbury saying, no, we don't want this. So they're being smart about this. So our understanding of the New Testament is that God does not work in tabernacles and temples anymore. Okay, that uh, he's not going to centralize himself. This isn't the Ark of the Covenant. You know, the, this uh, chapel it is not a place where God is completely uh, has his presence there and right there. Our understanding of the New Testament is God can make people in certain areas more able to hear him, more able to 
uh, listen to him and be more attentive to what he's saying. And I think that's, you know, if this is a revival, that is what's happening uh, here at Asbury Chapel. Uh, do you, are you going in there and, and it's all God? No. You, you, when you open the door, you're seeing people who, uh, for this moment in time, have the ability to uh, be more attentive and listening to uh, the very spirit and nature of God. Amen. I praise the Lord. Yeah. I see, and, and I think one of the signs for me that this is more than just uh, emotionalism is that people of dramatically different faith traditions are coming away with the same sense of unity in Christ. Mm -hmm. So there are people there who are speaking in tongues. That's not my tradition. And there are also, I read uh, a Catholic youth group went and they brought with them a monstrance and they had adoration of the Blessed Sacrament uh, in while so other people are speaking in tongues. Now, this would seem on the outside to be a bit of a babble of you going from one thing I don't agree with to another thing I don't agree with. But God was working through their particular cultures and religious practices to basically unite them as one brothers and sisters in Christ, even though one group wasn't speaking in tongues and the other wasn't adoring the Blessed Sacrament. Um, I think that sense of ecumenical unity is a good sign, and well, it's it's not it's not fallen into sectarian. You've got to do it this way or that way. Well, another evidence for me that it is of God is to see Christians fight over it. You know, when believers fight whether or not it's real, it might be of God. <laughs> from my visual history of watching uh, Christian history over the last two thousand years, um, but. Uh, it's too early to tell. Uh, pray for what's going on there. Pray that if, if this is not of God, that we would uh, discern that. Pray if this is of God, that it would never stop. Uh, that, that should certainly be our prayer for uh, a revival in this sense. Um, but also put in the comments, what do you think is happening in Asbury? And, and I know several members of my audience have gone. Of the audience mm -hmm. of Ang Ang Anglican Scripture of God, if you've gone, tell me your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, you know, there's several uh, thousand different testimonies uh, in the social media. I I'd like to know what Anglican Unscripted viewers think about their experience at mm -hmm. uh, Asbury Chapel. I think that would be pretty cool. Let me go on here to show notes. I lost the tab. Mm -hmm. Corruption. Oh boy. So we talk about Indian corruption quite a bit, and uh, uh, we at least try to end shows with it. We're going to end a show with Pakistani corruption. And one of our viewers has been sending us uh, emails about what's been going on in Pakistan, and uh, one of the bishops has been uh, found guilty of fraud and embezzlement uh, in the church, and we're going to talk about it, George. Sadiq Daniel, the Bishop of Karachi, who's yeah. since stepped down, uh, when this process began, was on Friday of last week jailed for 18 months for stealing, for fraud, stealing from the church. Um, this is a story that can be written all over India, in Bang uh, I don't know about Bangladesh, but all over India, north sure. and south, yeah. and in Pakistan, where bishops, there's some dirty ones there. And uh, it's just a shame, really, that... Uh, Corruption is, I don't want to say endemic, because that would be unfair, but it is so prevalent in the churches in the Indian subcontinent, the Christian churches. Well, it's it's prevalent there because it's natural in the society. They don't have the Ten Commandments. They don't have that, that kind of uh, wherewithal law system that's, that says corruption is bad. When a, mm -hmm. it's just a natural part of business in uh, that continent to operate that way, and they don't see it as bad. Um, and as such, the church, who should see it as bad, is unable to overcome it. Uh, much like the Church of England is unable to overcome the zeitgeist of Britain, uh, the Church of India and Pakistan are unable to overcome the zeitgeist that exists there george that's a one hour show boom right there i see one zero zero i'm kevin Coulson, and i'm george kong and you've been watching episode 790 
of Anglican Unscripted.